Hi. Hi, everyone. And um, welcome to this lecture, which is uh, titled Introduction to Meta-Analysis. And this is part of an introduction to research program for the fourth year medical students uh, at the King Edward Medical University in Pakistan. And um, I was I was very happy to be to hear from uh, Dr. Saeed, who invited me uh, to give this lecture. I could never say no to Dr. Saeed. I owe him so much. He has been so patiently uh, teaching me when I was a trainee at the Queen's uh, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Gateshead about 20 years ago. So I would never say no to Dr. Said. So here I am, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, this is obviously a pre-recording. Um, we we decided to do it that way to 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 be safer from uh, uh, from internet uh, disruptions. Uh, but uh, when you are listening to this uh, lecture, I will be there as well. And then after the end of the lecture, we'll have at least 15 minutes for questions and answers. So um, I am based at uh, the McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, um, in Canada. Um, and um, the, the reason I'm here talking to you is because I, I have worked a lot on um, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And I know you have heard the previous lecture uh, just recently on systematic reviews. This is on the meta-analysis part. So I've worked on this kind of um, uh, this kind of research for, for more than 25 years now. Uh, I am the joint coordinating editor at um, the Cochrane GATT group. Um, and as you know, Cochrane does this kind of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So, what we're going to talk today uh, about is, uh, well, first of all, clarify what is a meta-analysis. And then um, how can they help us and they help us provide better care for our patients? How can they harm people uh, by misleading us? And what do we need to do um, to read them uh, critically to avoid these pitfalls? And then finally, uh, I suspect that some of you may uh, in the end try to do, uh, to conduct one systematic review and meta-analysis. And um, I, I don't know how uh, easy access you have to research grants to do clinical research. I mean, when, when I was um, about many, many years ago, when I was in Greece uh, resident, I did not have access to these grants. So for me, working on meta-analysis was a necessity. That's how I started working on those, because I, I couldn't find a grant to do any other kind of research. Uh, in the end, it worked really well for me, and I, I love it. And that's why I'm here. Um, uh, so there's no nothing bad about that, about the necessity. Um, what I'm saying is that um, this applies to you as well. It's much easier to, um, instead of applying for a grant for a clinical study, it's much easier to just uh, have a computer, internet access, and your time, and uh, you just work hard, and you have a, an important and impactful impactful publication that helps others as well. So um, there's no way I can teach you how to do one in 45 minutes. Um, uh, but um, I mean, for example, we, we do three day courses um, in Cochrane where uh, and we, we we present them as introductory courses, the three days. So there's no way 45 minutes would be more than than an introduction to an introduction. But I can definitely tell you where to find information and uh, courses and training uh, to do it, to do this properly. So my disclosures, um, I, I do not have any financial or commercial interest either on this topic or any other topic. Um, I, I do have obviously a, 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 an academic conflict here because I, I work in Cochrane so many years um, and Cochrane is all about systematic reviews and meta-analysis so I do have a passion about it but this doesn't stop me from uh, um, from um, pointing out the the pitfalls and the problems that we have with this kind of uh, research. So 
to answer what is a meta-analysis, first we have to answer what is a systematic review, and you've been uh, through that, but I, I will have to repeat that, that a systematic review is an attempt to collate all, and I highlight the important uh, 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 aspects in, the, in this definition, all empirical evidence that fits a pre-specified eligibility uh, criteria um, so as to answer a specific research question, and then it uses methods. It uses explicit, systematic, reproducible methods that were designed to minimize bias, and therefore they provide uh, reliable findings from which conclusions can be drawn and decisions made. That's a, that's a long way to explain what is a systematic review. Meta-analysis now is when we do the qualitative synthesis of the results of the individual studies. So it's a mathematical approach to produce the, a summary estimate, a, a number. So this treatment is 2.5 times better than the other treatment. Um, from all, uh, if we put all the studies together, that is a meta-analysis and we'll um, talk about that, how we achieve that. Now it's important to clarify the, the, the relationship between a systematic review and a meta-analysis. A systematic review may have a meta-analysis, this uh, uh, quali qu quantitative um, uh, uh, product in the end that says 2.5 better treatment A than treatment B. Um, so they may have that or they may not. So uh, most um, systematic reviews actually don't have a meta-analysis. Many have a meta-analysis. Now, meta-analyses are usually done on top of a systematic review, and that's where, how they should be done um, at the end of a systematic review. But um, uh, theoretically, and, and in practice as well, uh, there are some that were published without a systematic review. So if, if there are 15 studies that looked on a specific topic, um, and I don't take all 15 and just pick three for any reason that I don't even need to tell you why, it is still a meta-analysis. But it's, I shouldn't have done this, this but I, I can do it. Um, and there are rarely some uh, examples of people who have done that. Uh, generally, uh, it's very rare to find justification to do it. Keep that in mind. Now, very quickly, because you should have gone through that in the previous uh, session, the difference between a narrative and a systematic review, the research question, this is uh, very, very important that it is um, a, a, the, the research question in a systematic review has a very specific structure. And uh, I will um, uh, explain that is the P-I-C-O-T, uh, the PICOT, Population Intervention Comparator Outcomes Timeframe. And I give an example. And this guy here um, is Douglas Adams. He's one of my favorite authors who explained in this book that you see there, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, the, the troubles that the, the whole section of the universe went um, through because they uh, did not define a question properly and they got an answer and they didn't know how what to do with the answer then. So very, very important, define your question properly. Then uh, the search, uh, of course, it's uh, very comprehensive in the systematic review. The selection criteria are very explicit. Then we assess the quality of the primary studies, and we'll talk about that. And then finally, the, the, the narrative reviews just uh, give a qualitative, non-systematic summary at the end. The systematic review may, may be qualitative, um, uh, or they may be quantitative. The quantitative is the meta-analysis part. The systematic reviews and meta-analysis are published as original uh, research articles and um, I think BMJ was one of the first um, uh, journals who started doing that. They are retrospective observational studies most of the times. Um, so think of them like um, a study that instead of uh, having uh, patients or blood samples, the, the study units are studies. So um, the uh, papers, published papers, instead of having 50 people um, as participants, we have 50 studies as participants. Now, lately, we have examples of prospective um, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, um, but these are quite difficult to, to conduct. Um, 
the, there are different types of systematic reviews and meta-analysis uh, and from uh, uh, increasing uh, order of complexity, the easiest ones are to do, to do are the RCTs, systematic reviews of RCTs. Observational studies are much more difficult, even more difficult. Uh, diagnostic test accuracy, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, uh, more difficult network meta-analysis, and you can also do individual patient data meta-analysis. And um, I mean, you, you, you have probably uh, realized that in the previous lecture as well, that, that to, I, I can do a narrative review on a topic that I know well over a, one day or even two days a weekend. Um, but it will take me 100 days or 200 days to do it in a systematic way, to do a systematic uh, review and meta-analysis. So why, why should we bother going through all that uh, work and effort? Uh, and why should people bother even reading them? People say, okay, it summarizes what we already know. Well, it's not that. We, we, we add value by summarizing um, what we already know, and I will explain what, um, why. Uh, the basic concept is what Isaac Newton said, that when we do that, we stand on the shoulders of giants. The giants are the other guys who did the primary research. We stand on the shoulders and we can see even a little bit further. Let me explain. So the systematic reviews appraise all, as I said, all evidence objectively. Um, and then they resolve uncertainty when primary studies disagree. And that's uh, the, 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 the rule, unfortunately that primary studies will disagree. And they also identify areas where new studies are needed. Now, when they have a meta-analysis as well, then they give us even more precision in the estimates of the, of the results. So for example, the treatment effects. And they can tell us when the time is ripe, when, when it is ready, uh, when it's prime time. So for um, clinical, uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Um, they, they can tell us when more clinical studies are needed versus uh, when it's time to uh, start uh, using the treatment um, or stop using the treatment if it is uh, harmful. For basic research, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, and there's a whole different, uh, a whole complete chapter on how to do those. Um, this can tell us when more basic uh, science studies are needed. So we, there's still uncertainty or we know uh, that uh, this treatment is not effective or is, is really harmful in animals, therefore forget about clinical trials in humans, or we know that this uh, new treatment is effective and safe in animals, and uh, therefore uh, we need to start uh, doing clinical trials. Um, and um, the uh, meta-analysis can help us um, with this exploratory analysis which is um, subgroup analysis, sensitivity analysis, and meta-regression that generate research questions that help us design better clinical trials. They do not give definitive answers, but they create really good questions. Now, they, there, are, there are lots of problems um, that, that the systematic reviews and meta-analysis can have. They, they're not really a panacea. They're not immune to bias. So there is a garbage in, garbage out situation. If all the primary studies are really terribly done and reported, then there's nothing we can do to rescue the situation. And um, there is a situation where um, um, there is uh, publication bias, and we'll talk about that. Um, we will talk about heterogeneity, um, inappropriate subgroup analysis choice of uh, summary statistics, um, odds ratio, uh, risk ratio, and so on. Um, and uh, the fact that we know the results of the trials ahead of time, um, ideally we shouldn't, but it's very difficult to mask ourselves to that. So, um, in principle, how meta-analysis is done is um, and I, I will have to borrow a slide from the uh, Cochrane training uh, slides, uh, slightly modified. So um, we, we, what meta-analysis does is take studies, let's say we have four studies, these are individual, uh, the data for each patient in the study. Um, we, it, 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 we calculate the 
effect measure for each study, one, two, three, four. And then the meta-analysis, uh, the, the second level, um, uh, calculates the effect measure at the review level. So first, uh, the summary statistic for each study, and then the overall summary statistic. Now, how do we do that? It's, it's a weighted average. It's not just an average. Otherwise, it would be much, much simpler. And uh, uh, to do that, we have to, the, the weight um, has to be chosen appropriately. Um, the idea, the concept is that we give more weight to the trials that provide more information. So the more events, uh, the more participants the study has, the, um, the more weight we give it to. Drink some water. So in practice, the way, uh, the method we use, most, system, most uh, models use is um, um, to, uh, uh, to give a weight that is the inverse of the variance, of the variability. So, um, and that's because the, the large studies with lots of events have little variability, give us a lot of precision, um, and the small studies uh, produce results with uh, lots of variability because of the small sample size. Now, um, let's use the JAMA user's guide to the medical literature uh, approach to see whether we can trust the meta-analysis that we see published. First, are the results valid? Um, so did the systematic review and meta-analysis explicitly address a sensible clinical question? Um, are all the components of the PICOs specified clear, clearly and is the uh, the question too broad or too narrow is it uh, this is the lumping versus splitting question um, and it could be too broad to be sensible and meaningful like what's the efficacy of cancer treatments in patients with cancer uh, it doesn't make any sense to put together surgery with chemotherapy with radiotherapy and skin cancer uh, with uh, pancreatic cancer this no matter what number this comes out, comes out from here, it, uh, I, I, it, it's meaningless. Uh, and the other way, I have an example there that is too, 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 too narrow, too precise to, to, to be of, uh, of, of much use and be worth um, for, uh, for writing a paper on it. Now, um, you, you, you have to talk about the search that has to be detailed, exhaustive, that it should involve an information specialist for sure. Um, then uh, the other stages like selection, assessment of studies, data extraction, objective, uh, are they objective and reproducible? Um, it is important to do all stages by two people independently. Um, you should have pre-specified inclusion, exclusion criteria, data extraction forms, the Prisma flow chart I'll show you in a moment and then report the studies that you excluded and um, uh, with reasons for exclusion. That's the Prisma flow chart. Um, you can look it is up how you present the, the, the flow um, chart of studies. And then a uh, very important part is to assess the quality, the risk of bias of the study. Now, what, what, what is bias and how it, does it differ from imprecision? Now, if we were doing this uh, live, I would ask you some questions, so, but, but now I have to tell you the answer that bias is the systematic error, imprecision is the random error. So if a study is biased, repeating the study multiple times would tend to produce the wrong answer uh, most of the times. Um, for imprecision, um, the, we, we have different uh, effect estimates because of sampling variation, because of chance. So smaller studies, greater chance, uh, less precise. Um, and this is reflected in the uh, confidence interval. So here, if you repeat the study, um, uh, if you do as with a larger study, is uh, it will have less imprecision. Um, so bias, as we said, is a systematic error or deviation from the truth in the result or inferences. It can occur on either direction. It could increase or decrease the, um, the result or vary in direction. It could be small or large. Um, and remember, we, we cannot really um, 
say if a study is biased, we can say if they, they, it is a, at risk of bias. So the results of a study may be unbiased despite the methodological flow. That's why we always say, what is the risk of bias of a study, not what is the bias in the study. Um, and uh, many times in um, meta-analysis, difference in risk of bias explain uh, the variation in the results of the study. So high risk of bias studies may have a different result than low risk of bias studies. And of course, we believe the low risk of bias studies in this situation. Um, there are many tools to assess the risk of bias. And um, um, the, what, what you have to remember is don't use scales, like the Haddad scale, for example. Just, just don't use them. Um, conceptually, they are very easy and um, very, very. Um, it's very tempting to use them, but we don't really know what weight to you give in its component of the scale. Usually, they give the same weight to its all components, and uh, um, they, it has been proven that they 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 cannot really uh, measure what they're supposed to measure. Um, an example of a. a Proper tool um, is the risk of bias assessment, um, the Cochrane's risk of bias assessment, assessment for RCTs. Uh, I give you here the, the domains that it has. Um, you, you can look it up. I'll give you the, um, the resource link at the end. Uh, keep in mind that there is a risk of bias two tool, the second one, um, more advanced. The number, the the one, the first version would be adequate for you if you're starting doing, to, if you're starting uh, your work on meta-analysis now. And that's how it produces the results with uh, traffic light signs. Um, so these are the studies, these are the domains, and you can see that, for example, this study is good in all domains. This study um, had some uh, serious risk of bias in a few domains, uh, and the yellow or um, orange uh, yellow here is the question mark is when we are unclear. And there are other tools uh, for observational studies, for diagnostic accuracy studies, for prognostic studies, and so on. And remember the trustworthiness of your, um, of your or somebody else's um, systematic review and meta-analysis depends on whether they have pre-registered their protocol for Cochrane reviews that's uh, standard. Um, for um, uh, non concurrent reviews, you can uh, register them in Prospero, and you see the link here. Now, um, what are the results? Um, to understand the results, we have to understand some uh, the way the, these are uh, reported. Uh, forest plot is a term that you see. Um, it's a nice term, but nobody really knows why they call it forest. That's how it looks. I mean, it would look as a forest if it was um, rotated by 90 degrees. Uh, now it's more like fallen logs, but anyhow, it's a term that um, that sticked and it's a nice, beautiful term. So there we go. Forest plot. That's a forest plot. Um, and this is an example of a meta-analysis that I did a long time ago, PPIs for acupeptic ulcer bleeding. Uh, these are the individual studies that were included. And uh, the middle, uh, you see the red, this is the line of no effect because we're talking about odds ratio. So odds ratio of one means that there's no difference between the, um, the medication and the placebo. Um, and uh, anything on that side of the graph means it uh, favors the PPI. Here it favors the control treatment. Um, for each study, we see the point estimate, which is the middle of this box. Uh, the size of this box corresponds to the weight that this uh, study has in the overall um, pooling of the studies. So you see they, they, here there's not huge difference between them, but I'll show you other examples. Uh, the, the width of this line represents the 95% confidence interval. So basically this means that if it doesn't cross the line of no effect, like this study, it means that the results were statistically significant. This study uh, does not have statistically significant results. And in the end, we have this beautiful diamond. Uh, the width of the diamond is the 95% confidence interval for the pooled effect. So this is much, much more narrow, usually, 
most of the times um, of all the individual studies. So it gives us a really good precision and estimate of what's the pooled effect. And we can see here numerically the result. Now, uh, the, the best way to present them is with even more details, where if you give the events uh, per, per arm, uh, the total number of events for each study, for uh, the control and the PPI, uh, the weight of the study, um, the odds ratio when it was published. And here you see that's an uh, uh, imaginary example um, that I made up so that you can see the difference in the box. This study has 37% almost of the weight, has a bigger box than this study that has less than 1%. The other thing you will notice is that um, this study, the CARDI one, um, has much more weight, almost 60% than the next one, Kuro, um, which has 1%. You can see this in the boxes as well. Although the last one has more patients, uh, more participants, that's because um, the, the weight is driven mainly by the events, not so much by, by the um, overall participants, but by the, by the events. So although this study is smaller, the cardi one, it has much, much more bigger weight. Um, now, what is heterogeneity? Heterogeneity, you have to understand that, um, to understand the meta-analysis, is, is the variability among, among the studies. And we use this term sometimes to describe the clinical heterogeneity, how the patients or the settings or, or the treatments differ between them. Um, some people use the term diversity, so to avoid confusion, clinical diversity. Um, methodological diversity also probably is a better term than methodological heterogeneity. And most people, when they talk about heterogeneity, they, 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 they mean the statistical heterogeneity. How do the numbers differ? Um, how is the variation in the estimates of the individual studies beyond what we would expect by chance? And uh, this is an example again of uh, a meta-analysis where there is heterogeneity. You, you, and you may say, well, they, they look very similar because um, heterogeneity is when the confidence intervals for the results of individual studies have poor overlap. And you say, well, they do overlap. Well, if you look carefully, they don't this with that one do not overlap and that with that one or that with that one do not. Um, so this we, this is enough to cause significant heterogeneity in the meta-analysis. And there are statistical tests to, to test for heterogeneity, whether there is or not heterogeneity, a p-value of uh, uh, less than uh, 0 0.1. You see, we're a bit more strict here, not 0 0.05, of 0 0.1. Um, provides evidence of heterogeneity. There is statistically significant heterogeneity. And there is a statistic to quantify um, the heterogeneity, the I square, the percentage of the variability in the uh, estimates that is due to heterogeneity and not to chance. Um, it's, it's not that easy to interpret that. And you can see here at the bottom, uh, some, uh, some suggested uh, ranges um, and how to interpret them. And you'll see that there is an overlap between the ranges. And, um, uh, and again, you will have access to these uh, uh, slides and the recording afterwards. So you can go back and look this uh, in detail later. And that's another um, situation where there is no heterogeneity. Uh, so here, no matter how you, hard you try, you will not find studies that do not overlap, even that with that and that with that overlap a little bit. And you see that the R square here is, is much lower, it's almost zero. Um, heterogeneity, again, um, could be in a study like this one, a uh, study. Uh, the, again, it's, a, it's a one outcome of a, a bleeding, peptic acid bleeding guideline. You see here the I square is 32% P, is below 0 0.1, statistically significant heterogeneity. Um, and so the studies differ among them more than what we would expect by chance. And why? Um, sometimes uh, you can find why by predetermined subgroup analysis. For example, here, um, the studies that were conducted in Asia and patients with peptic ulcer bleeding tended to uh, 
produced different results than those who were conducted in Europe. Um, so when we split them accordingly, and there is a biological rationale for doing that, and we're, not, we're not just trying to, to find a, a hundred ways to split the studies until we find one that works. Um, so the, the, it, it, it seems when we split them accordingly, then the heterogeneity was eliminated completely from each group. So each group is homogeneous, they're the same, and they differ from the other group. Now, what's a funnel plot that you will see often in uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis? Funnel plot is a, a very smart way um, to, um, to assess for publication bias or for small side effects, and I will explain the difference. Um, so um, if you have a plot here, this is the effect size, um, one is the, uh, for the odds ratio is uh, no effect, anything on this side favors the PPI, anything on this side favors the control, it's like still the same example, PPI is for peptic ulcer bleeding, and that's the, uh, for, for um, whether it reduces re-bleeding, for example. And then uh, the, that's the interesting thing here, uh, on the uh, y-axis, we have this that looks quite weird, the standard error of the logarithm of odds ratio, well, this is a long way to say that the, the more precise studies are, are, are placed high and low down, you have the imprecise small studies. Um, and the concept is that uh, the, the large studies would tend to be closer to the true effect. There's le less variation, less chance. And the small studies should be more scattered on either side of the, of the actual line where we found. This, is, this dotted line is the actual result of the meta-analysis. So they, they should be scattered on either way, much far further away towards the bottom, the smaller studies, more like an inverted funnel. Um, that's why they call it funnel plot. Uh, and you would expect them to be symmetrical on either side. But in reality, what we see in life is that um, more studies are published in this area than, than here. So you see there are missing studies here. This is the, what we think is a publication bias in this situation. So um, there were these uh, 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 four, five, seven studies, for example, here that were published uh, that were really tiny. Let's say studies with uh, 50 patients each that uh, showed that the PPIs work really really well in this study so that it's 10 times better than um, than uh, uh, the control treatment so um, the authors were able to publish them because the editors loved them they say all right i mean it's so that it works we we probably know it works i mean let's publish a study but there are other guys probably another six or seven guys who uh investigators who published who published who produced the similar studies very small that by chance produce the opposite result, that let's say placebo is 10 times better than the PPI. Now, good luck trying to publish that. When they submitted it, they probably were told, come on, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to publish that. So these are missing, um, but the, the end result is that they, by having these studies and not having those, this dotted line is just stretched, pulled a little bit towards better results. Um, so this produces a biased um, uh, as a estimation of the, the pooled effect. Now, um, they, there is this visual um, assessment for, uh, um, for asymmetry in the final plot, and, and there are proper statistical tests to assess for that, like the Eggers test or the Beggs test and so on. Now, what you have to remember is that um, this little um, asymmetry is not always caused by publication bias. Sometimes there, is, there are good reasons where the small studies could have a completely different result. Um, and, and we can discuss that at the end. Or it could be fraud, or it could be chance. Uh, I mean, the most common reason is publication bias, but keep in mind that these other three can also apply. And finally, how can I apply the results to patient care? Uh, the questions to ask are, 
were all patient important outcomes considered. So, I mean, the, the systematic review meta-alliances do look at all important outcomes or just a couple of two or three that they, they wanted and then some other really obvious um, were completely um, omitted. Um, are any postulated subgroup effects um, credible? And I'll show you a, a tool to use here. Um, are the benefits worth the cost and potential risks? Uh, what is the overall quality certainty of the evidence? So a nice tool to use when you assess the credibility of subgroup uh, analysis is the one that um, Gordon Guyot and his colleagues um, uh, pre reported, um, developed. And you can find it either in the book or in his uh, journal articles that were published in JAMA. You can look him up. Very important is I would strongly encourage you to invest on learning more about GRADE, um, which is a, a tool to assess the certainty, quality we used to call it in the past, the quality of evidence. Now, better term is certainty of evidence. Um, and the strength of recommendations. Um, again, developed by Gordon Guyot and Holger Schooneman um, here at McMaster University. So um, obviously there's, it's a continuum, the certainty of the evidence from, from very low to very high, um, but it, it, um, it's easier if we uh, use four categories, high certainties when um, further research is very unlikely to change our confidence in the estimate of effects. So basically it's almost unethical um, to do more research when we really know the answer. And uh, very low certainty is a situation where anything can change, anything. I mean, I, I, we publish a guideline, we publish a paper, and we think we, we suggest that this is the answer. And then next morning, another study gets published and it can reverse everything. So everything is so fragile and can turn upside down um, within one day. And in between, we have moderate and low certainty. As I said, I, I strongly encourage you to learn more about GRADE how um, the RCTs start as high certainty of evidence, but can uh, be downgraded for these reasons that you see here, these uh, five reasons. Um, cohort of case control studies start as low, um, but can be uh, upgraded for these three reasons that you see here. Case series start as very low and stay as very low. And now, if you want to actually do a systematic review and meta-analysis, um, there, there are lots of resources. Um, now, just, just for Cochrane, and there are many, many organizations that will help you do that. I just happen to know Cochrane really well. Um, the, the, the resources are almost infinite. Um, go to that link on Cochrane Training. Um, you, you will get access to the Cochrane Handbook for systematic reviews of interventions. There is a different one for systematic reviews of diagnostic accuracy. Um, very detailed, uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages. Uh, you don't have to necessarily read it from, uh, from start to end, uh, but it will be very helpful to uh, look specific points that you are interested in. If you read it all, that's even better. Uh, there are interactive online modules, there are live webinars, and there are really good three-day courses, uh, either in person or, or online nowadays. Uh, so, in conclusion, systematic reviews and meta-analysis should be critically evaluated. They're often flawed. Even the ones of the highest methodological quality are not a panacea. A safe conclusion sometimes cannot be reached. So sometimes they conclude that they don't know. That's okay. Now, the, however, despite these uh, issues, the methods for conducting systematic reviews and meta analysis are constantly being improved. So every day we become better, and every day I learn more. Um, and um, we, we're getting there. Uh, we have still some way to go, but we're getting better day by day. And keep in mind, even if they're not the perfect tools to give the answers for everything, they're still the best tools that we have nowadays, um, especially in a situation where the primary studies 
um, produce um, conflicting, contradicting results. So with that, um, I thank you very much for your attention. And now I will stop the recording and um, I'm ready for the questions.